Welcome to the show. Thank you for making time for Africa. This week we host an incredible woman who works with the United Nations. She's the African Woman of Excellence 2015, Nardos Bekele Thomas. She shares her insights into development and growth in Africa. We get your views on the issues. And as always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. Nardos Bekele Thomas is the resident representative of the United Nations Development Programme and also the resident coordinator of the United Nations system in Kenya. She's got an incredible profile and she just in this year, 2015, won the African Woman of Excellence Award. Let's get some of those details. Ms. Nardos Bekele Thomas is the resident representative of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and the resident coordinator of the United Nations System in Kenya since 2013. Ms. Nardos Bekele Thomas is a seasoned and experienced UN official and has served in similar capacity in Benin. She served as regional private sector policy advisor for Africa from 1998 to 2001. She also served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Africa Business Roundtable, an Africa-wide umbrella private sector body. Ms. Bekele Thomas has been a recipient of numerous awards including the prestigious Living Legends Achievers Award in 2006, Crown of Peace Award from the Federation of Peace in 2010, and was recently awarded the Africa Woman Excellence Award, AWARE, in 2015. The award was conceived as a platform to recognize women of Africa and the diaspora who have contributed to the struggle for political, social and economic independence at various levels with excellence. Ms. Bekele Thomas holds a master's degree in economic development, monetary economics and econometrics from New York University, NYU, and a PhD candidate also at NYU. Now let's get straight to her views on Africa, youth, development and growth. Thank you so much for making time for being on the Africa Leadership Dialogues. First things first, congratulations on your award. It's an incredible thing to be recognized by the African Union, the Diasporan African Forum, uh, as uh, the Woman of Excellence 2015 here in Africa. What does this mean to you? Well, you know, I was just humbled uh, by the fact that among the many, many uh, who have contributed really to the empowerment of women, to youth, um, you know, youth empowerment, and contributed really in general to development of our continent. You know, to be considered among with you know the uh, presidents of uh, Liberia, the president of uh, you know uh, Malawi, and all these wonderful ladies was just so humbling. But, uh, you know, I sort of felt that, you know, in this, the UN was recognized and also the African Business Roundtable, uh, which I worked as CEO, was recognized. So, you know, it just, it just meant a lot to me, really. It's an encouragement, it's a motivation for me and all women to do more. What kind of a young African girl were you? Where have you come from? And where do you want to see the continent, please? <laughs> well, I was born during the emperor's uh, regime in Ethiopia, as you know, and in 1974, I was a young, um, at that time, brilliant girl who finished her high school, uh, her high school um, at the age of 15. So I was the youngest to, to join the university and I got, you know, an award from Haile Selassie, the emperor, right. at that time. And one year into the university, then there was all this curfew. And I grew up as a, uh, as a teenager in this whole um, turbulence period, right. you know. And, and I saw so much bloodshed. Um, I saw so much destruction. Um, and, you know, even at my family uh, level, you know, I lost my two brothers, 
Um, my father was in prison. So, you know, I went through, and my grandparents were burnt, you know, in, in their own house. So I went through so much, you understand? And that's why I'm always, if you see me, so passionate about peace. Mm -hmm. And I keep on telling Kenyans, you know, what you have is priceless. You know, don't squander, you know? So I started, you know, my journey of, you know, um, adulthood in such a turbulent period. And um, I'm a self-made person. Passed through all that, and it gave me strength and stamina to withstand all the other obstacles, which I call them, were really nothing as compared to what I had to go through. What perhaps is a main focus for many on the African continent, which is the African youth. We always say here on the show, really the greatest blessing for this continent is to have such a young, vibrant population. It remains in pockets quite a challenge as well. Um, you have actually been working in this field for a long time. And in fact, in West Africa, have initiated projects that show how we can make a change. Tell us about what you've learned about how we can best utilize this asset that is the youth. You know, actually, you said it, Julie. I mean, this is a real asset. Yes, it's a challenge, but I see it as a wonderful opportunity for Africa to leapfrog. And we have to really make sure that we use this asset properly. Um, like in West Africa, and here also, in 2005, 2006, you know, we started this youth empowerment with the late uh, Minister of the Youth, Ministry of Youth. I'm sorry, which country was this? This was in Kenya, actually, yes. in 2004, when I was here. Ah. We had a very So you started it right here. here in yeah, Kenya? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I started it a long time ago, uh, from uh, the time I was in India, then went to Bhutan, then went to Comoros, then went to... I mean, I'm talking about the 80s. Okay. And since the 80s, I was saying, listen, you know, unless we do something about the youth, unless we really harness this potential, we're going to make them to turn to be, you know, a threat to the society. So my whole focus was on youth and women throughout my career. And, and you know, what we did was you know, to see on how we can use the youth to be creative, to be innovative, and not to be uh, dependent and to be, you know, a threat finally to society. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this, these children go out of school. Can you imagine our children? You invest in them. You have so much, you know, expectation from what, from your investment. Mm -hmm. But also as a mother, we, we always see good things. The best thing that we can do is to make sure that our children are better than us. Right. Better than us. Better than but us. I mean, it's so, so important for us to embrace that as a community. Yeah, yeah. How do we grow them and empower them? Exactly. Right. And then after going to school, they're in the university, they go out of school. They don't have jobs. They're sitting, you know, watching TV for those that are privileged right. and that have TV. Others going around in the streets. Okay. They're hungry. Okay. They know that their, you know, mates or their peers are somewhere else. And they had so much expectation from us, from this world, from the government, from everybody. And certainly, you know, they turn up to go to be a threat to the side because they are in the crime, you know. Or nowadays, you know, they go and join, you know, the terrorist group. You know, it's an opportunity for them and there is no other alternative. Speaking of violent extremism and just what we've seen here in East Africa, particularly in Kenya, some very vicious attacks on fellow youth. Um, what we're seeing with Boko Haram in, in Nigeria, people walking into mosques and felling worshippers, going into churches with bombs. This is a question that perhaps is... is more analysis required as to what motivates young people to go into violent extremism because we know that we can't seem to profile these people very often. Sometimes you'll find somebody from a fairly well-off family, mm -hmm. you'll find others from poor families. You also ask the question, even if you were paid, what would motivate you to agree to violence to appear? I think you're right. I mean, we need to do more study, an in-depth study, an assessment of this. I mean, I remember in 2006, we did a study about the crime. That was the time when crime was really at its highest in, in, in Nairobi. And then we found out that 60% of the crime committed 
in Nairobi was committed by the youth. So that led us to understand that it's hopelessness, that is joblessness, that is poverty that led the youth to be involved in crime. You know, it was based on that. Nowadays, there is a phenomena, like you said, that even those that come from a wealthy family, well of family, okay, educated, you know, that have opportunities to, to, to have jobs, joining, you know, uh, this whole group and becoming really a threat to their own society. And, you know, so, you know, I have this understanding now or this theory that, yes, joblessness, yes, unemployment, but also the degradation of social values is a problem. Because in a family, the mother goes to work, the father goes to work, you know, the child is left alone. So there is no one that would inculcate the societal values, you know. And unfortunately, our learning institutions are not doing it before. Remember, during our times, I remember, you know, you go to, to school, the values were clear. You know, you have to be truthful, you have mm. to be honest, integrity, all these things were inculcated in the curriculum, you know, of the learning institutions, which is no more. And you come home and we are so stressed out, you know. You know, the father his way, the mother her way. And there's no one that takes care of these children and the, give them the fundamental thing, which is really value. So I think, you know, these two are the ones that are playing a major role in turning this youth to be what they are, you know. We talk about so many things. We, you know, get together in forums. We try to have workshops. We. We look into these matters, but how often do we highlight and focus on social values? Yeah. So who is failing? <clears throat> who is failing? I mean, the society is failing in general. I remember, you know, when I first came, you know, my first interaction with the, the president, His Excellency, was based on social values. And we said, okay, there will be a national, you know, dialogue, you know, looking at the social values. Mm. What went wrong? What are the institutions that are responsible? How do we restore social values? But of course, you know, uh, it didn't come to fruition for so many reasons, like any other thing in, in, in Kenya. You know, things start well, and then it just gets derailed. How and why? A lot of people, a lot of people sitting at home say, great idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, we yeah. want to contribute. I remember a few years ago, we had a conversation around the Kenya we want, and, and I met an old man who had traveled hours to come and tell us what kind of a Kenya he wanted. So a lot of people at home think, thinking, we want to share views. What are the, the, the barriers to, to engagements like these? Well, I think, you know, we always say governments or we always say donors. And I really do not agree when people say donors as an African. You say it's not it's an African. insult. You know, it's an insult. <laughs> oh, right. You know, really, right. Because, you know, our country depends, you know, on what we want to make it to be. You so know. we should so fund. We should fund and we should take, the, you know, responsibility over that. Um, but, you know, here, you know, what happens is that uh, we have to prioritize what are certain things where there is no compromise, where everybody should unite, political parties aside, ethnicity aside. Okay. Where are the areas where we should unite? Mm -hmm. You know, I should say values and in values, is corruption also in it because it's integrity. Mm -hmm. So in that we have to get united and we say, okay, fine, this is our agenda, this is our country's agenda, and we should really uh, implement it and, and make sure that we have results mm -hmm. to show. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, that is what is so critical, not only for Kenya, I've been saying it to many countries in Africa, because Kenya is one of the seventh countries that I have worked in, and I keep on telling them, yes, politics, yes, but you know, there are certain things that are really, really beyond individual parties or beyond individual interests. There is a collective interest. There is a country, there is only one country. And we have to really build that country. And there are certain things that we say, fine, you know, we have our differences, but on this, we are united right. and we have to fight it. Right. Security Common ground. Common grounds, yeah. Mm. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues.
what what have our leadership our politicians got right if anything what are they getting wrong how do they turn the situation around well there are so many things that i i come after i came back you know after how many years six years mm -hmm. and there are so many things that that was done you know uh, right so there's been some yeah. progress yes, you're there saying is a progress mm -hmm. there is progress but you know and always you know in kenya normally we want to work to talk about you know the things that are missing and not <laughs> things that are done but kenya is making progress you know mm -hmm. kenya is making progress but we have also to know that we are making progress but we are also it's in relative terms to others are we making progress as like ethiopia is doing are we making progress like rwanda is doing you know there is also you know this comparison mm -hmm. that we have to make but certainly kenya has made a progress kenya has the most progressive constitution and i keep on saying kenya has devolved devolution is is the right thing as do. much as it has its hiccups yeah that's you know it, it's a huge step yeah, forward it is a huge step mm -hmm. and there will always be problems but you know the thing is that when there are problems we have to come up with solutions and solutions that are homegrown right. we have to accept that there is a problem and we have to get together around that problem and say what are the solutions and build a consensus around those solutions because kenyans are brilliant people Kenya is one of the leaders in this continent. If Kenya fails, you don't have East Africa. I keep on saying that mm -hmm. to my own country and to the countries uh, in the neighborhood. Kenya is the lead and it has to show leadership. And and you know we I mean I call myself we Kenya so <laughs> Good. Sorry. we we are happy to <laughs> we are happy to own you and welcome you to be part But of our I feel that I'm Kenyan and that's Wonderful. one of my problems actually. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Uh -huh. But you know, I think as Kenyans also, we have to appreciate yeah. our own country. Hmm. We have to build the capacity and capability of understanding that we are Kenyans and Kenya is you know, a great country. We have to have patriotism, which is very important. And we have to go beyond this ethnicity, mm -hmm. which is killing the country. Mm -hmm. To someone sitting at home who asks, okay, what is patriotism? How would you, how would you define it? Yeah. Uh, rather than defining it, mm -hmm. I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. And it's a very funny story. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Nigeria, and uh, you know, a Nigerian was telling me about Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. And the moment I said I'm an Ethiopian, he told me, oh my God, you're an Ethiopian? I know that these Ethiopians, when you think you're talking about Ethiopia, you start with Ethiopia, you end up with God, okay? <laughs> Which is great. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk, you start about Ethiopia, and then you end up with this. So he said, you know, you say you kill yourself. For, these are his words. You kill yourself for your country. So I said, I looked back, and I reflected back, and I said, yes. All our songs are about patriots. Right. How our country is big, how we are wonderful, and you know, even the worst time in '83, okay, Ethiopians felt they were really the, you know, creme de la creme. They still had yeah. self worth yes, and self pride, self -worth, even going through the worst. Happy. Yes, right, exactly. Mind you, the refugees in Kenya, yeah. the Ethiopians, are proud of who they are as Ethiopians. And yet, this is the same country that has made them to leave their country and come here, you know, and they're refugees, mm -hmm. they don't have status, mm -hmm. but they still feel that they are Ethiopians. They still embrace their culture, you know? So how do you take a national sense of belonging, I think that's mm -hmm. what that is, exactly. and sense of pride and apply it to being part of progressive development? How, how do you do that? When Indians have done it, mm -hmm. Ethiopians here have done it, the Rwandis have done it, and I think Kenyans, you know, have all, uh, you know, what, you know, for all, all what would make them proud of mm -hmm. what they have. So, you know, I don't know what, but, you know, it's part of the social values that we mm -hmm. should inculcate. Comes the back people, to, yeah, social, to values. social values. And patriotism, belongingness, you know, confidence, having pride, in your own country, 
even in your ethnicity, in mm. the diversity, you know, is so important. But a positive pride that a does positive. not negate anybody else's exactly. value or self-worth. Exactly, right. exactly. Because each one, each ethnic group has its own strength and weaknesses. So we have to build on, on the strength. You know, a Kenyan, you know, um, I, I always... Uh, you know, um, tell my colleagues in the office, I say, whenever they complain, I say, but you know you're complaining about this, but look at this other country. Right. Why do you have to complain? Because this country is a wonderful country right. that is a host of so many people, you know, and so many institutions and so many companies, so many, you know, you think people would go to a bad country? No, mm. but there is something good about Kenya, and it is there, it's visible. So how do we recognize what is good and tap into that and grow exactly. that? Just tapping still into the idea of how to build on what is good, particularly for young people, for women. We also talk about the, the disabled and, and what were marginalized areas, marginalized communities. Um, there's a real feeling now in the world that when we talk about growth and development, it must be inclusive. We mm -hmm. must ensure we're pulling everyone along with us. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? And what are you doing at the UN to ensure that we're building capacity mm -hmm. to, to, for inclusive growth? Yeah, I think, you know, um, uh, our focus is on inclusive growth. And what we are doing is that, you know, we had a profile, a socioeconomic profile of all, at that time, district. Then we expanded it to be, you know, at the um, uh, uh, county level. Mm -hmm. And we have that, and we know exactly where the counties are in terms of their growth, in terms of the MDGs. And, and based on that, our programs are geared towards these areas. Um, and these areas, unfortunately, are the known ones, you know, northeastern, northwest, some, some of the counties in the northwest, and the coast now because of the security. And we are focusing as a UN, mind you, for the first time, the UN, the 27 agencies are coming as one entity and going and trying to solve, you know, the, the problems in the various counties. And this has been facilitated by the fact that, you know, these are, there is devolution and we have CIDP and the counties have budgets. Mm -hmm. So what we do is just support the county government in really making sure that, you know, the dire fundamental things are, are, are made. But we are also trying to see on this um, uh, uh, equalization fund, you know, if this could be now uh, given to these various areas that are marginalized so that we can accelerate the growth. I think, you know, the governments, the county governments are also in a hurry because they have to show results. They you know? must. They're, they're under sure. pressure. You know, yes. They are under pressure. So, you know, we capitalize on that and make sure, you know, the fundamental social services mm -hmm. are delivered in these in these areas. You must have seen from my tweets, you know, Mandera, when Mandera was burning, mm -hmm. the UN was there. Right. It was one solidarity. But to show that Mandera means a lot to us. Right. The people of Mandera mean a lot to us. And when you go to these countries, you know, it's, it's true. You know, you feel so saddened. You feel so sorry. And you feel so, you know, you're puzzled. As how to how this could have happened this could for, have so, happened long, for right. so long. Mm. So, and, and you know, and now it's becoming a breeding place for the whole extremism and mm. uh, violence. And it is our duty to solve that. So we are in these areas. But we are coming out also with some special flagship programs that we call beyond the normal ones, mm -hmm. doing business unusually. Like, for example, in, in uh, and this is area-based mm -hmm. programming, like we're going to Turkana as one UN, but we're bringing along also all the donors, and we're supporting the Turkana government in implementing its county integrated development plans. Mind you, in Turkana, there was this conflict, political leaders and not getting along with, and we had to do that. So we had to create that conducive environment. So behind the scenes, we do all kinds of mediation, A lot of cohesion negotiation, work going, cohesion on. Work going yeah. on. And then once that is done, then we go together and we are implementing now a program which is integrated. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, this program would, although it's, um, already started impl being implemented, but we will launch it at one point in time and we would invite you. Be happy to then we are 
going to Mars with because these cross-border issues are very critical and the world needs to address these cross-border issues because there are communities, like for example, the community of Moyale, okay? Because I worked there in 1975 as a young, um, uh, university student wow. and I went for the national uh, literacy campaign so I know that area and I was telling them I used to cross you know the, the Ethiopian border and I would be in the Kenya border teaching this literacy campaign not knowing that I'm in Kenya right you, you wouldn't even know I wouldn't even know so because these are the same community Okay, if these are the, the same community, you go to Moyale, you ask them. They don't care whether, you know, you ask them, are you Kenyan or mm. uh, Ethiopian? Mm. They don't care. Mm. You know? Because the communities they live easily. side by side. Exactly. They are one community. The Garbas, the same, the Moyale, you know, in Moyale, the Garbas, the Boranas, mm -hmm. and all these, they live in one community. Mm -hmm. The problem that is created is created because of lack of resources. Mm -hmm. You know, to some extent, some is political. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to address that as, you know, uh, a joint program, the government of Kenya, government of Ethiopia, the UN countries team, the 27 agencies from Ethiopia and the 27 agencies from Kenya, all of us will coming out with an integrated plan to address the community's needs without saying Kenyan, Ethiopian. Fantastic. And the amazing thing is that this has been also the priority of the president so the president is really keen to seeing this program off the ground. So is the prime minister. So soon you would also see these flagship programs coming up. So partnership between Kenya and Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Initi initiatives like this, but also I think learning that when stakeholders come together with their areas of strength, Mm -hmm. and, and address the issue, for instance, of basic services for the people, you can start to transform the conversation. Exactly. And there would be economies of scale. Because, you know, if you see, for example, on the Ethiopian say, side, if there is an abattoir, we don't see why 100, 200 meters from, from that same abattoir, we build another one here. So instead of that, we can have a meat processing you know, uh, mm -hmm. industry here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can see, we can have a mapping of what exists and what is lack, uh, what is lacking. Mm -hmm. And we can see on how to address it, you know, for the benefit of the community, rather than saying, okay, this is a Kenyan, this yeah. is an Ethiopian. Right, rather than you know? saying the border mm -hmm. exists and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, yeah. it's, it's fascinating to hear that. What's your hope for the continent? I am a very optimist person. So I look back, I look at the 75, 74, 78 during the Red Terror of Ethiopia, and, the, and I see now what Ethiopia is today, and I see there is hope. Africa has hope. Africa is an emerging country. Uh, even when I was the African Business Roundtable executive uh, CEO, I used to tell you know, the investors, I say, listen, you know, you want to invest, go to Africa. That's where you, where you make your profits. Mm -hmm. You go to Africa because Africa has so much potential. Mm -hmm. And Africa has certainly risen, you know, to what, you know, um, I was expecting it to be, at least as a person. And it's showing that, you know, there's so many countries now coming up, becoming middle-income countries, 22 countries, right. are on that path right. to being middle-income countries. You see Rwanda coming out of the war. You see Uganda coming out of war. Yes, there are, there are certain problems in Burundi and others. And I think, you know, this is a natural, you know, sort of problems that you see. But in the final analysis, I think Africa would rise. It will be like, you know, the giant, you know, continent that we want it to be. We see it coming, mm. we hope for it, we pray for it, but we must act to make it happen exactly. as well. So as we close, I'm gonna ask you to look into the camera and please deliver a message. We as Africans sometimes may feel entitled, but in your story, you've told us you felt a great sense of responsibility. What responsibility do each of us have to the continent? Yeah, I think, you know, we always have a tendency in Africa to put everything on the government, but we have to understand the government is what we have elected, and you know this government cannot deliver everything. A leadership is not only at the government level, leadership is at each and every 
individuals level, a family level, individual level, community level, um, a party level. So, you know, we have to assume this leadership. We have to know that we are in Africa for reason and we have to leave a legacy. Like I said, and I repeat, you know, we want a better continent for the generation that come. And that can only be done if we all, you know, take our responsibility seriously. Thank you very much for joining us. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. This is Nardo Spekele Thomas, and you're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogue. What an inspirational woman with a fascinating story. And what I've taken from that interview is, no matter what your circumstances or where you've come from, you can be part of ensuring positive growth and development for others. That's a choice each of us has to make. Are we going to build a good society or sit back and lament at the challenges that we face? Time now for your views on the issues. This week, we asked you, are African countries doing enough to grow and retain untapped talents? Timothy Gashusha says, Natural resources aside, youth in Africa are the new untapped economy to leapfrog Africa to the future. Hi, I'm Ella Gadoni Ireri and I'm watching Africa Leadership Dialogues in Nairobi. We need to create more awareness about the available facilities like dance schools, music schools, football academies and film schools by advertising them so that people do not go abroad to source for them. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And now we go to Africa's top 10. This week on Africa's Top 10, we feature the states with the best capacity to retain talent. The objective of the research was to determine the capability of a country to retain talented people. This is according to the World Economic Forum. Starting us off at number 10 is Gabon, with an index of 3.4 and is ranked at position 66 globally. Coming in at number 9 is Botswana. The South African state is ranked 59th globally with an index of 3.5. Positioned at number 8 is Ghana. The West African state attained an index of 3.6 and is ranked at position 57 globally. Taking the number 7 spot is Cap Verde. The island nation is ranked at number 54 globally with an index of 3.72. Slotted in at number 6 is Angola with an index of 3.74 and a global ranking at position 53. At number 5 is South Africa with an index of 3.79 and is ranked at position 50 globally. Anchored in at number 4 is Côte d'Ivoire. The Republic is ranked globally at position 49 with an index of 3.8. Kenya takes the number 3 spot. The East African state attained an index of 3.85 and is ranked 47th globally. Coming in at number 2 is Morocco. The North African Kingdom is ranked at number 45 globally with an index of 3.89. And at number 1 this week is Rwanda with an index of 4.3 and is ranked 27th globally. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. And we close with our African proverb. If you wish to move mountains tomorrow, you must start by lifting stones today. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.